in your budget, one of your expenses is a payment to yourself for either a savings or an investment. Unlike savings, investing involves some risk. That is, you are not guaranteed to earn more than the amount you invest. The amount you invest is called the principal. In fact, there is a chance you could lose part or even all of the principal. To save money means to put it aside in a bank account for buying something in the future or to have on hand in case of an emergency. That money is available for you to withdraw whenever you need it. Although the bank pays interest on the balance in your savings account, that interest often does not keep up with inflation, which is the rise in the cost of goods over time. People typically save for short-term goals such as a new car or a family vacation by putting the money in their savings account where they can re retrieve all or part of the money whenever they want and with some interest. When you invest money, you have an entirely different objective, to make more money. A financial investment is something you put your money into with the purpose of getting more money back. An investment can also be one of time and labor. For example, you might invest in a lawnmower with the goal of making enough money mowing lawns over the summer to earn a profit. You can also invest in yourself. We will talk later about what kinds of return on investment and skills and education can create for you. When you invest money, you have an entirely different objective to make more money. The financial investment is something you put money into with the idea of making more money. Unlike savings, investing involves some risk. That is, you are not guaranteed to earn more than the amount you invest. The amount you invest is called the principal, and there is always a chance you could lose part or even all of your principal. People put money into stocks, bonds, and real estate, and they do not have a guarantee that their principal invested or any earnings on the principal will be returned. Risk is a part of life. Everything we do involves risk. While some of life's risk are large, even life-threatening others are hardly noticeable. Risk cannot be avoided. Putting your money in a mattress risks the actual loss of the money if there's a house burns down. Depositing money in the bank is a risk of loss of purchasing power of the money with inflation. But risk can be identified, understood, and sometimes managed. However, because of the greater risk Investors have a chance to earn a higher returns, income or an increase in value than they would have from a savings account, especially over a long time period. In general, the greater the risk, the higher the potential return, or the higher the potential risk. Some people are very comfortable with taking very high levels of risk, often seeking out opportunities to do so. Other people avoid risk at all costs. A good example is the folks here. They are the original founders and employees of Microsoft. Some investors bought stock in the company on the first day it was available to the public back on March 13, 1986. You have to admit they were a motley looking group. But if you bought a share of that day for the offering price of $21, you would have 1,024 shares today worth more than $52,000. And that doesn't even count the almost $1,500 that it will pay this year alone in dividends. By the way, the guy in the lower left is Bill Gates, now the wealthiest guy in America. Of course, every stock hasn't worked out as well for investors. Here's a chart of WorldCom stock, which looked like another Microsoft at one time, before it became an investor's nightmare and went bankrupt. Be sure to record your thoughts on the worksheet for the things we've just discussed. As part of this requirement, you're asked to explain the concept of simple interest and compound interest, and how these might affect the results of your investment. Simple interest is the interest earned on an investment money, sometimes called the principal. As an example, if you put $100 into an account that earns 6% interest annually, that investment would be worth $106 at the end of the year, and you could withdraw the $60 to use for other purposes. Compound interest is where you add the interest to the principal, you do not take it out, and you wind up using or earning interest on your interest. As an extreme example of how that works, let's take uh, the 
an example of Peter Minuet, who was the director general for the West Indy Company, and uh, he was asked to buy land for a colony back in 1626. On May 4th, 1626, he purchased what is now Manhattan Island for 72 guilders worth of goods from the Manahatta Indian tribe. Now, assuming that those 72 guilders were approximately $72, and assuming that there was a Chase Manhattan Bank in 1626, what alternative investment might the Indians have made? Well, as an example, they could have bought a 400-year certificate of deposit from Chase Manhattan Bank with a 7.2% interest compounded annually at that time. Uh, Seventy-two dollars at seven point two at seven point two percent will pay the Indians about uh, five dollars and eighteen cents a year on their investment. With simple interest, those folks would be paid five dollars and eighteen cents every year for four hundred years, and that would have totaled over twenty thousand seven hundred dollars. On the other hand. They could have bought a 400-year certificate of deposit with a 7.2% interest compounded annually from the Chase Manhattan Bank. And in 2026, they would have approximately $28 trillion. That's a lot more than the 2070, and that's a pretty dramatic demonstration of the difference between simple interest and compound interest. Of course, they might have been of really tough negotiators, and when they went down to the Chase Manhattan Bank, they could have insisted on receiving 10% interest compounded annually instead of 7.2%. And they would have received a check at that time then for $825 trillion. You see what a big difference there is between 7.2% interest and 8% interest. You know, uh, This being the case, the Indians certainly didn't come out ahead since they sold something that they didn't. This being the case, the Indians certainly did come out ahead since they sold something that they didn't even own in the first place. It was the land that belonged to the Canarsie Indians, not the Manahats. A recent estimate of the value of 843 acres of Central Park can be a basis of a realistic estimate of the current value of the island of all and all that the Manahat Indians without the buildings. That would place a value of somewhere between eight and nine trillion dollars. So uh, they did pretty well on their sale. They just didn't do very well on the reinvestment of their proceeds.